with the guys because you've been there so many times. We need a day where we just come and eat meat um, with your lovely wife and um, all the kids. Amen. Um, so turn me to the book of Genesis. We're starting a new series. Um, it's on the book of Genesis. Um, it's, Genesis has 50 chapters. So I'm going to work a way around them to at least try and cover the whole book. I'm not going to be able to do a lot of details. I'm going to have to do um, just some overviews, but then I'll find certain scriptures which I'll zero in on. And today I'm focusing on Genesis 6, 1 to 8. Um, but unfortunately, this is just an introduction. I'm going to deal with these verses properly next week because I have to try and cover the book and then um, work with the verses. The author of the book of Genesis is Moses. It's part of the, uh, a five-volume work which we call the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The date of when he wrote this book is not very clear, but most scholars believe that he wrote it in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt. So they came out of Egypt in 1446 BC. So the date is um, somewhere between 1445. Some people say it's a year later, but sometime after 1446 uh, BC. And it's also believed to be the first book that Moses wrote. Where was it written? It was written in the wilderness. After they came out of Egypt, as you know, they went through the wilderness for 40 years, and it's there where he wrote it in the bush. And who does he write it to? He's writing it to the children of Israel. They've been slaves for 400 years, and now he's transitioning them from slavery um, to the promised land. And the purpose of the book of Genesis, the word Genesis uh, comes from the Greek translation of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint, and Genesis means origins. And uh, it is a book about the origins of the universe, the origins of humanity, the origins of sin, the promise of redemption through Jesus Christ. It's also a book of the origins of the Abrahamic bloodline. Um, so Genesis is one of the most important books in the Bible because imagine if the Bible started at the book of Exodus and you're just seeing these slaves and you're like, what's going on here? And then they're going to the promised land. We've got a promise from Abraham. And you're like, who's Abraham? And we need the book of Genesis to understand the whole Bible. A uh, person of Unlocking the Bible says that um, the two books which the devil hates the most are Genesis and Revelation. Because Genesis shows when he enters the earth and Revelation shows when he exits. Genesis shows when he makes men fall, but there's the promise of redemption. And then in Revelation, we see the end of Satan. So the reason why Paul is writing this, it's very important when we're studying the Bible, that we study the original audience. What is going, why did Moses write this? Why is he writing the book of Genesis? Before we rush to I'm blessed in the city, I'm blessed in the field, before we rush to all these things, we've got to understand why is Moses writing the book of Genesis? He's writing it because the children of Israel are coming out as slaves from Egypt and they've been influenced by Egyptian religion. And there's so many creation myths and I'm going to only show you two. So now he needs to clearly tell them where they come from. And one of the challenges we have as Africans is we don't have history outside of colonization. All we know a lot of our history is based on the colonial story. But we don't know about Africa. What was Africa like before colonization? Because we don't have a lot of written materials. When you hear about people like Mansa Munsa, it's not for us to believe that the richest man was once an African called Mansa Munsa. Because in our mind, we just think of the usual Elon Musk's and the Bill Gates. We don't know that Africa had a rich history before uh, colonization and slavery. So... To help them possess the promised land, he has to show them where they came from and how powerful they were before they were slaves. He has to show them that we were blessed. We've got the blessing of Abraham. We were not always slaves. Are you hearing me here? 
And as Africans, we were not always colonized. We were not always poor. There was a time we were kings and rulers of our own continent. Even Christianity, Christianity came here before colonization came. Paul and them sent missionaries here way before colonization. There were already churches in North Africa. Our history is so bad that Kevin Hart, the comedian, is about to be banned from doing his comedy show in Egypt because he believes that the original Egyptians were blacks. They were not Arabs. And it's true. But because we don't have written history, we can't believe it that the original Egyptians who built the pyramids and possibly even made the children of Israel slaves were actually black people in charge, a powerful empire. So we just see ourselves as victims and because of that, it's hard for us to dream and it's hard for us to believe that we can be backable because our only concept of ourselves is we are victims. Are you hearing me here? So Genesis, in the book of Genesis, I'm going to give you four different structures. The first one I'll give you is just the simplest. You have to divide it into two sections. The first section is known as the prime evil history, which is uh, Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11. Um, and then the second part is known as the patriarchal history, Genesis 12 to Genesis 50. The primeval history presents um, the history of the universe, creation, and how creation was ruined by sin. And then from 12 to 50, it's all about um, the Abrahamic, Abraham and his family, and how God is going to restore them, uh, restore the world through the seed of Abraham. So turn with me to Genesis 6, and I'm reading from um, the ESV, English Standard Version. And it says, when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, this verse is powerful. We're seeing the blessing which God spoke of um, Adam, be fruitful, multiply at work. And then it says, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and took as their wives any they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever. For he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, say the Nephilim. Say the Nephilim. I want you to research who the Nephilim are. We're on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Verse 5 is the key verse. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth and it grieved him um, to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I have made them. Verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Other versions say Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Father God, we thank you today. May we find grace and favor in your presence. Help us, Father, to share this critical word. Help us, Father, in this new year to find you in your word and to center us around the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Give God praise. Amen. For a few minutes today, I want to ask the question, why is the world messed up? Why is the world messed up? Thank you. Um, my Bible talk today is concerning um, the creation myths which the children of Israel were exposed to, which necessitated the need to write the book of Genesis. Um, the first creation myth which they were definitely exposed to is the Egyptian creation myth. Um, in the Egyptians had actually four creation stories. Their creation stories were different based on four different regions in Egypt. Um, there was the Hermopolis myth, the Memphis myths, the Thebes myth, and the Helipolis myth. Today, for the sake of time, I'm just going to deal with the Helipolis myth. Um, 
According to the Egyptian Helipolis myth, it says that the world began through a process where there was an infinite darkness. And in that infinite darkness, there was this mass of directionless water called the Nun, the N-U-N, the Nun. This water, this body of water called the Nun, it was dark. Out of that water rose up um, a god by the name of Atum. He came out of this watery mass by the sheer power of his thoughts and his will. He just rises up and when he comes out of the water, he is um, a genderless God, but he manages to have sexual relations with his shadow. And his shadow, you guys are already looking like this is the crazy story. <laughs> This will be a powerful movie, a Nigerian movie. So it will actually be a good Daily Sun headline. Eh? Woman gives birth to shadow. So he has sex with his shadow and gives birth to two children. And um, he gives birth to a son uh, who becomes the god of the air and a daughter called Tefnut, who becomes the goddess of mist and moisture. And these children give birth to other gods, and all these gods begin to create um, the world. And one day, this god is missing his two children, so he takes out his eye and sends his eye throughout the world to look for his children. And his children find his eye, and they bring it back to him. But as they're carrying the eye, the eye um, misses the children and begins to cry. And as those tears become human beings, this sounds like a Marvel movie, so human beings came from the tears of this man. And, um, but in the Egyptian creation story, there were many gods, and all the gods had different functions. The god of the sun, the god of the air, the god of uh, fertility. So for the universe to work, it required many gods. And if you wanted the universe to work for you, you had to worship each god. If you wanted rain, you had to worship the, ra the rain god. If you wanted money, you needed to worship the money god. If you wanted an iPhone, you had to worship the Apple god. There were so many gods that you had to worship in order for things to happen in your life. And then the other dominant creation myth was the Mesopotamian creation myth, uh, which is called the Enuma Elish. According to them, earth and humanity were created as a result of a conflict between gods in the universe. So they argued that there was this big fight in the universe. Several gods were at war. And a god called Maduk killed a goddess called Tiamat. And then he uses her body to create heaven and earth. And from her blood, he created human beings. And human beings had one job, to do all the hard labor so that the universe can work and the gods can rest. So they created humans as a slave force so that the gods can rest. And these are the two dominant creation ideas at the time when the children of Israel are in the wilderness. And the two major differences between this, these two ideas and the Bible is the biblical account of creation um, spoke of one God who created and sustained the universe. And secondly, he's a God also of grace. He's a God of grace. The other gods are not gods of grace. They're gods of strict obedience and anger. But we serve a God of grace. So he's a God of grace. My case study today is just a review of South Africa in 2022. If we had to review South Africa in 2022 and we are to list two columns, the highs and the lows of last year, a lot of people will agree with me that there were definitely more lows than highs last year. And one of the challenges in South Africa is we're constantly bombarded with bad news. And the, the constant bad news we're bombarded with creates an atmosphere of anxiety, depression, and anger. And those are three dominant issues we, we are processing in South Africa psychologically and emotionally. It's either someone is anxious, someone is depressed, or someone is angry 
about something happening in South Africa. For example, if we just use December um, and the three biggest stories in December, uh, first of all was the ANC um, electoral conference. It created a lot of anxiety when it was happening because there was so much chaos around it. We didn't know what's going to happen. So there was a, an anxiety which just came from that. So it was a low point in December. And then straight after that, on New Year's Eve, we're just about to celebrate Christmas, we hear news that there's a gas explosion, a horrific gas explosion, and where 37 human beings died on Christmas Eve. People are about to go celebrate Christmas, and if you saw some of the videos or some of the pictures, it was a horrific scene. People were burnt, there were some with body parts, there were children who died. And so just before Christmas, we've just come out of anxiety of ANC. And we're about to now celebrate next thing. We are dealing with the trauma of an explosion. And then on Christmas Day, we want to eat. We're now seeing a video from Free State of teenagers being assaulted in a racial issue. So in less than a week, we've moved from anxiety to depression to anger in a very short space of time. Now we are eating Christmas angry, saying, white people, let me see a white person today. <laughs> and at my holiday, I walked in this other restaurant. What was it called? Benguela. It was my first time in South Africa to enter a place where there were only white people. It was like 200 white people. Even the waiters were white. I was the only black. And as I walked in, someone said, the mob is there. Oh, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm messing with you. <laughs> but I felt like, they, I felt like they're going to say, is the, has this person come to clean or deliver something? I'd never experienced that in my life in South Africa. I needed to know that there's places where it can be strictly white. And straight after reading that children are not allowed to swim, I was really shocked. And I saw that racism is still alive in Muzanzi. Are you hearing me here? So we've had many lows last year, and that was a low point, and it raised up a lot of rage in us. But it's through studying Genesis that I learned um, that these three low points all have one thing in common, which I'm going to discuss through Scripture. The book of Genesis has many highs and lows, and the lowest point, of course, has to be Genesis 3, the fall of man. If there's a point after the fall that could rank as the second lowest point in Genesis, it has to be Genesis chapter 6. And this is punctuated by an interesting insight which Moses gives us into the heart and mind of God in terms of his reaction to the wickedness of man in the earth. Uh, Genesis 6 verse 6 shows us a unique response by God which flies against the doctrine of the impassibility of God. Say impassibility. Uh, the impassibility of God is a doctrine which says God does not experience pain or pleasure from the actions of another being. And uh, in Genesis 6 it says, And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So when I saw this verse, when I was studying for this uh, series, um, I felt this verse begin to speak to me like the burning bush uh, in Exodus 3 verse 5. And uh, the burning bush, God said to Moses, do not come any closer. When I read this verse, I began to hear this verse saying, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. There are certain scriptures, when you're reading them, you just can't read Sometimes you have to take time and say, what is going on here? This is not a normal statement. To, to read that God regretted that he made man and it grieved him in his heart is not a light thing at all, uh, which must just be preached without care and caution. Particularly because Genesis 6, in particular Genesis verses 1 to 6, is a passage of scripture with many theological landmines. I strongly believe that there is no preacher who walks through these verses. There is no preacher who preaches Genesis 6, 1 to 6 uh, without uh, it coming out scarred or unscathed in some way. Because in these verses, 
there have been many brilliant theologians and scholars um, who've taken different positions which they hold on to with great passion and conviction. So whatever position you take, you will be struck by an equally compelling opposing view. This portion of scripture has been the battleground for theologians, pastors, preachers for many years and many centuries. And uh, the reason why there is so much warfare just in these verses, it's concerning these seven issues. The first issue in Genesis 1, um, Genesis 6, 1 to 6 is the identity of the sons of God. Who are these sons of God in the text? The identity of the daughters of men. Who are they? Three, um, the, the statement where God says, his days shall be 120 years. There's a lot of conflict there. Number four, the identity of the Nephilim. Who are the Nephilim? Are they giants? Are they fallen ones? Who are they? Number five, the biological composition of the Nephilim. Are they parademons? Are they parahuman beings? Are they, what are these Nephilim? Number six, the meaning of the word Nephilim. There's a lot of debate there. And number seven, God regretting that he made man. So as a preacher this morning, uh, I'm inviting you into a wrestling match I'm having with these scriptures. And it is my desire that you, after this service, you go home and you study and start to draw your own conclusions on what these things are. Study what are the Nephilim. Study who are the sons of God. Who, what's going on? What does it mean that man's days shall be 120 years? Uh, so verse 5 states that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of their thoughts of his heart was continually to evil. In, this is such a sad state of affairs. Every man in the earth was now in sin and wickedness except one man, Noah. Whatever the population was. Can you imagine, let's just say there were a hundred million people. Only one man is saved. Everyone else is in sin and committing wickedness. And this verse is a, is a summary of the horrific state of affairs which the world uh, was in. It was in a state of chaos. Every man of evil you can imagine was running wild on the earth. There was murder. There was rape. There was human torture. There was human sacrifice. All manner of sexual immorality. The world in this text is in a very chaotic place. And the question I want to answer this morning is how did we get here? How did the world get so bad? Why is the world messed up in this text? Because this question will help us understand as believers why the world is so bad. It will help us understand in South Africa why do we see so much crime? Why do we see so much corruption? Why do we see so much uh, racism, xenophobia, poverty? Why do we see greed in our economy? Why do we see all these things? Why? Is the world so messed up? Why is South Africa broken? Why is Africa broken? Why are there so many divorces? Why are there so many evil things happening all around us? So to understand the state of affairs uh, in Genesis 6, as well as the state of affairs in the world today, we have to go to Genesis 1 verse 1, where it says, In the beginning... Uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Oh my God. Uh, this verse is critical because it tells us with no apologies that this world we're living in today did not come from a random event. It was created, designed, orchestrated, and initiated by God. Say God is the creator. In the creation story of Genesis, Moses is setting the record straight in terms of who created the world and how he did it because of the many creation myths from Egypt and Mesopotamia which the original audience of the children of Israel are gravitating towards and they are influencing their thinking. Our position of God creating the heaven and the earth is critical for our Christian belief. 
in Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1 to chapter 11, it's a polemical statement where Moses is attacking other views of creation in Moses' time and in our time. Arnold and Bayer said, all great civilizations of the Middle East had mythologies of how the universe began and the Genesis account of creation was unique because it demolished many of the cherished beliefs of the day, namely two ideas, the plurality of gods and the insignificance of humanity." Unquote. In that Genesis, we see the triune God who creates the universe by himself and sustains it by himself and then he creates humans in his image and likeness and he values them and shows them grace. Oh my God. So the idea of a powerful God who loves humanity and seeks relationship with them was a unique idea which wasn't common back then. Even today, all these world religions they don't position their God as a relational God who wants to come to earth and dwell in a loving relationship with his people. This is the year where you have to pursue God and, and seek him and develop your, your intimacy and your quiet time and your devotional time on a level like never before. In 2023, don't allow a day to go without praying. Don't allow a day to go without getting in the word. Don't allow a day to go without worshiping and falling deeper and deeper in love with our God. So Genesis 1 gives us a glimpse into the power and glory of our God. Genesis 1 is a breathtaking, mind-blowing display of the power of God. But it's just a glimpse of how powerful our God is. It doesn't even give us a full picture of what he is capable of doing. In Genesis 1, it shows that God creates the heavens and the earth from nothing. It is what scholars call creatio ex nihilo, in that before God spoke, there was nothing. And he creates the world from nothing but his words. Uh, and the scientists who don't believe in our creation story believe in what is known as the Big Bang Theory, that the universe was formed by nothing. Oh, nothing plus nothing made a big sound which began the process of the universe being made and even us on planet Earth. Their position is all creation comes from nothing. Their mathematical equation is nothing plus nothing made everything. It takes more faith to believe in this scientific theory than it takes to believe in the Bible. To believe that nothing plus nothing made everything. The Christian view is God plus nothing made everything. It, it, our position even makes more logical sense that in order for the world to have a beginning, there had to be some, something or someone to cause it to happen. Our position is that God spoke the world into existence and he created everything. He created everything with his words. Oh my God. So, in describing how God created the universe, Hughes argues that the verb create is the word bara. Say bara. And bara contains the idea of effortlessness, that creator ex nihilo was actually effortlessness. And what this means is that when God rests on the seventh day, it's not because he was tired. He didn't even break a sweat when he was creating the earth and the universe and the stars. It was so easy. He just said, let there be light. And instantly it was there. Let there be the stars. Let there be the moon. 
let the effortless he didn't they were <laughs> god is powerful we have no idea how powerful god is he just spoke and immediately what he spoke came into being from nothing from nothing but his being ladies and gentlemen of the modern day church we have to be prayerful and careful when we talk about concepts of affirmations and decreeing and declaring and ideas that we can speak things into existence like God did in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is such a display of power which no man can replicate and no man has ever replicated to speak something into existence. You can't pull up anyone who stood up and said let there be a car and it was there. Let there be a house and immediately it was there. We don't have this level of power. This Genesis 1 creates a separation. I know we like to say there's divinity in me, but guys, God is another level. He's is God is on a level of power and glory which we can never get to. Are you hearing me here? Ecclesiastes 5:2 says, "Do not be quick to speak and do not be hasty to utter a word before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few." When it comes to God, ladies and gentlemen, our orientation must always be to be in awe and wonder of how great he is, how powerful he is. how mighty he is how glorious there is none like him there is none beside him he is so powerful that there can't be multiple gods they are all figments of the imagination of man there's there's some preaching which we lie as preachers the devil is attacking you are you hearing me here the devil does not know a single person in this room by name he is not omnipresent like god he is not omniscient like god number 2 he is very proud the devil will never come looking for you you are not on his level financially economically <laughs> he is very proud of that man that being is very proud He doesn't just go for anybody. He targets strategic people of high levels of influence. Those are the people he goes for. But here's the reality. Even the devil himself is not on God's level. So even if he wants to attack you directly, he has to go through God first. Because he cannot violate the sovereignty of God. God is in control. Nothing happens in the earth which he doesn't see or permit. The enemy cannot attack you without God's permission. Are you hearing me here? He has to look for God's permission. Ask Job. He has to look for God's permission to come after you. So some of your attacks are not the devil. There may be demonic systems or demonic spirits, but the devil himself He is very proud. I hear him here. He's very classist. He's very arrogant. I doubt he visits certain countries. So though we are created in his image and likeness, we are not little gods. Listen to me. We are not little gods. Say you're not a little god. we are created in his image and likeness but we are not little gods he has given us some of his attributes which are known as the communicable attributes of god but they are always finite for example he gives us spirituality love you cannot love on the level of god you cannot love on the le- god loves you despite seeing all your secrets he can see everything but he still loves you 
his goodness, his wisdom. We cannot be wise on God's level. He's on another level of wisdom. But God also has what are known as the incommunicable attributes. These are elements of himself only he possesses and he can't give us. For example, his omnipresence. None of us can ever be omnipresent. We can't be everywhere all the time. That's an incommunicable attribute which separates us from God. His omniscience. He can't give you all knowledge. Your brain will explode. Your little hard drive. Your two gig. Your five. Your Pentium two uh, will explode with the information that God has. Are you hearing me here? We cannot have his immensity. We can never be as big as him. We are confined to space and time to where we are. That's why he is God. He is God alone. And when he says in Genesis that he speaks the earth and universe into existence, he is showing us his power. He is showing us he is wise. He is showing us he is the creator. And all our affirmations or declarations must always be through prayer, through God. It mustn't be you, because only he can speak it into existence immediately. But you have to pray it into existence. Because we have to be careful that some of these things start to get us out of prayer and say, I am the God, I can, I can do it myself. But, and it violates relationship. Because he is seeking relationship with you. And we have to come to him and ask, bring our supplications. Because he is powerful. He is wise. He is the creator. And there is nothing that is impossible. So if you put your faith in him and you trust him, he can open the doors for you. He can bless you. He can give you the wisdom of how to, how to generate the revenue to get that car that you want. He can give you the wisdom of how to build that house, how to make your marriage better, how to, hallelujah, how to find the right person uh, to marry or to date. He can give you the wisdom and the favor, but it must always be through Christ, through Christ, through your relationship, through, through your relationship. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Our obsession must be him. And it's through his power that we're able to succeed. That we're able to prosper. That we're able to grow our businesses. Develop our families. And succeed in life. It is through God and his power. Are you hearing me here? Say I'm going to be God centered. The gospel today is very man centered. It's very me. Very me. There's a church, their theme for this year is the year of me. This year, it's all about me. Though we're having a crossover. This year, it's all about me. I'm tired of being a blessing to others. It's all about me. That is not biblical. Because our calling is always to serve, to be a blessing. Even some of you, the reason why God is going to bless you so much is so that you be a blessing, not only in church, but also in your family, also in your community, also to the poor. The reason why God is going to give you resources, it's never just for you. It's for your children to be able to set them up so that they are generationally blessed. It's for your family so you can help out all the issues and nyayas in your family. It's for your community in South Africa so that you're able to help with the inequality. The blessing of God always has a purpose of not only blessing you but blessing others. It's never all about you. God's will is never always about you and you alone. It's always community. Our father, not my father, not my papa's father. Our father who art in heaven. He is ours. He is for everyone. Say he is for everyone. So what interests me in Genesis 1 is God creates the world in six days. And he uses an interesting order. The first three days of creation 
are days of forming. And then the final three days correspond with those first three days. They are days of filling. On day one, let there be light. Day two, he forms the sky and the waters below. Day three, he, pr he brings the land out of the oceans. And then he begins to fill the land um, with plants. Day four, he fills the sky with the sun, the moon, the stars. Day five, birds and fish. So that's when the chickens came, hallelujah. And then day six, animals and man, he begins to fill. Because God is all about order. Before he fills the thing, there must be order and structure. So Donia, right, for God to bless, you must bring order and structure to your life. You don't have to die to go to hell. Marry someone without order. Date someone without order. Go to a hotel without order. Hallelujah. We went to an interesting hotel with um, my wife and my mother-in-law years ago in Durban. As soon as we arrived, we looked at the picture online and the disorder. We suffered. You know a holiday where you wish you were home every day. The, the sheets were smelling of I don't know what. So you have to sleep on top. It was, another, it was another mess. God cannot bless this order. There has to be order. So before God fills the earth, he brings order. The earth was without form and void. It was chaotic and empty. Chaos creates emptiness. Order creates increase. So when you bring order to your life, Get a driving license. Bring order. Stop driving without a driving license. Bring order to your qualifications. Study. Go to school. I'm going to write a book on prosperity for Africans. It's going to be one page. One page. It's not a, there's not a thousand keys. First page. Go to school. Get a job. Are you hearing me here? Or get a skill. Build a business. Book finished. Book finished. It's very simple. There's not a thousand keys to success. Go to school, get a job, get a skill, build a business. Zapera. Go and get what God wants you to have. Are you hearing me here? Are you hearing me here? It's not complicated. You can do it and you will do it. The God who created heaven and earth said, bring, he's showing us, bring order first. Then the filling begins to come. This is a year to bring order to your life. Bring order to your spiritual life. Bring order to your health and fitness life. Bring order to your diet. You can't keep eating mafutas. Eat healthy. Work out. Bring order. Bring order to your family. Bring order to your relationships. And you're going to see increase and blessing on a level like never before. Even in the beginning, God... We put God first. That's the order. And everything else gets filled in our lives. And then in Genesis 2, he rests on the seventh day. He forms man from the dust in Genesis 2. And he places him in the Garden of Eden. And the key verse is 16 to 17 of chapter 2. He says, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall die. Oh my God. The forbidden fruit. Then the chapter closes with God making Eve from Adam's rib and instituting the first marriage. And there's a powerful statement uh, concerning marriage. And I want to bless the marriage. And he says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. In marriage... Holiness puts you in a place where you have nothing to hide from your spouse. Sin puts you in a situation where you're always hiding aspects of your life. Your thoughts, your desires, your fears, your vulnerability, your cell phone. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me here? There's a pastor who left his phone when he was preaching. 
And it started to ring. He said, Lord, <laughs> ushers, bring my phone here. Are you hearing me here? But holiness brings you to a place where you can, you've got nothing to hide from your spouse. Because you're in a place of grace, in a place of love, and in a place of honesty. And then in chapter 3, we come to the fall of man, which is the lowest point in the history of mankind. And the consequences of chapter 3 we're still dealing with today. Chapter 3 of Genesis is the chapter of the fall of man. In this chapter, we see the most destructive force enter the earth. It's introduced by the devil, and this force is sin. MacArthur and May, who stated that of the 1,189 chapters of the Bible, only two books and four chapters do not mention sin or sinners. That is Genesis 1 to 2 and Revelation 21 to 22. So the only times there's no sin in the whole Bible is in the first two chapters and in the last two chapters. Um, and, and when we look at the world without sin in the first two chapters, it's, it's a world of perfection, a world of joy, a world of happiness, a world of order, a world, a world of prosperity and, and human flourishing. Because sin comes against, comes against joy. Sin comes against happiness. A lot of unhappiness is created to lack, is linked to lack of holiness. Anytime you are moving in places of sin, it's impossible to be happy. And uh, the wickedness we see in Genesis 6 is the ripple effect of the power of sin released in Genesis 3. So as to answer why the world is messed up, it's because of Genesis 3. Why is the world messed up today? It's because of Genesis 3. Why am I messed up today in my thinking and my living? It's because of Genesis 3. There are many definitions of sin, and the two common ones, um, when you look at the Muncie uh, Dictionary of Bible Terms, the most common one is to miss the mark, number one, and number two, to rebel against God, in particular the law of God. MacArthur and May, you argue that sin must be viewed through a theocentric or God-centered standpoint, in that sin is actually a violation of the creator-creature relationship. They argue that man only exists because God made him and in every sense is under the authority of God, his creator. The creature is not greater than the creator. So anytime the creature rebels against the law of the creator, they argue, and I quote, sin causes man to assume the role of God and has set his own autonomy for himself apart from the creator, unquote. If that is so, it means that sin is a rebellion against the rulership and authority of God that stems from him being the creator. As the creator, he has the legitimacy, the right to create the laws for his creation and the right to judge and mete out punishment when the laws of his creation are violated by the creatures. And this is why uh, the biblical view of creation is challenged and attacked by man, because if we can prove without a shadow of a doubt that God created everything, it means we have no choice but to obey him. But if we came from nothing, Nothing plus nothing. It means we don't have to obey him. We don't have to believe he exists. We don't have to challenge him. So they, we can become our own gods. Oh my God. And in Genesis 3, the temptation of the serpent to Eve was not for food. But Carson says it was an invitation to the de-godding of God and the de deific deification of man, in that man was becoming God himself. He says, you can be like God. And this is the temptation Satan still presents to man today, removing God from his place of rulership in our lives. 
and authority over our lives and making ourselves our own gods. Hmm. And from that day when sin entered the earth, it changed everything for the worse. And from the time Adam and Eve left the garden, sin and its destructive effects in the world get worse and worse. The more I read Genesis, the more I'm, I'm beginning to understand the destructive nature of sin. Sin is destructive. All these low points, racism is an ugly sin before God. To mistreat someone who's created in his image, not by you. White people didn't make us. God made us. Who gives you the right? To say we are lesser human beings. You didn't create anything. We're created by the same God. Racism is a sin. And there's people in hell today because of nothing else but racism. He says, you looked at my image and said it is inferior. How dare you come to me and want to come into my house? And you've despised my image in the earth based on skin you didn't create. Depart from me you worker of iniquity sin is very destructive when we look at some of the challenges we're having with ESCOM it is sin and corruption, greed mismanagement which has destroyed all these which has destroyed all these power plants it's sin in the heart of man to not have compassion that we've got people who came out of poverty for years under a demonic system of apartheid. How can we create opportunities for people to have affordable energy because they need it for their families? Children need to study, not under candles. When we see schools in the rural areas without toilets and no classrooms because somebody wants to wear Gucci in Sandton City because someone wants a Range Rover Defender, while you've got children out there, it is sin in the heart of politicians. Greed, not caring for human beings, not serving human beings. A philosopher called Steve Compella has said a statement. He said, on an, on, on an aeroplane, one of the most uncomfortable seats is the pilot. The pilot's seat cannot be comfortable because he will fall asleep and crash the plane. And his philosophical position was, when you go higher in leadership, it's not about your comfort. You can't be using resources for your comfort. Because once you're too comfortable up there, you'll forget everyone and crash the organization. The destruction of African countries is because of sin in the hearts of political leaders who do not care about the people who do not care about the roads. It's a sin. My brother and sister, I want to tell you that when you show up late for work and you're not working properly and delivering at your job, but you're coming to church worshiping, you are sinning at work. Not doing a good job is sin. Because you have signed a contract with tasks and objectives. In that interview, you said, I am backable. Now you're showing up late and you're not delivering on the job. Doing bad work in the marketplace is sin and a misrepresentation of God. Are you hearing me here? If you get a contract to deliver something for the government and you don't deliver it, it is a sin. They have trusted you to deliver to the community but you've taken the money and bought a Range Rover Defender, but you are not delivering. It's a sin. Lack of excellence in the workspace is a sin, my brother and sister. Stop sinning. Repent and deliver. Repent and show up to that job. If you hate that job, they apply for the one you like. Are you hearing me here? And deliver there. But while you are there, you're going to represent the Most High. You're going to produce excellent work. If you're a waiter, you're going to waiter excellently. If you're an investor, you're going to manage that money of that company with excellence. 
If you are in real estate, you're going to sell those houses and be a blessing to those families that are buying houses. You're going to deliver and deliver because you're always doing it as unto God. It's also a form of worship. Your work is a form of worship. And when you're not doing it well, you are, my brother and sister, under the power and influence of sin. Are you hearing me here? In the African context, in describing um, the understanding of the fall, Y.J. Kunyop describes how most African cultures have theories and traditions on the relationship between God and man and how it was broken. Most African cultures believe that there was a time where God lived on earth with man. And man did something to God that sent him to the skies. The theories in African history range from a woman who was grinding grain and she accidentally hit God in the face to a man who started a fire and the smoke irritated God and God said, I'm leaving the earth because you started a fire. I am out of here. Amen. And, 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 and they argue that men broke a regulation of God. Some say men started eating eggs and God said, you're eating eggs, I'm going to heaven. Some say God said no one is allowed to eat bananas and uh, people started eating bananas and God had to run away. Some said men started to eat yam and through breaking that regulation, they made God leave the earth and retreat to the skies forever. And this is very interesting that in African tradition, um, there's, it's very close to our biblical understanding in terms of how man broke a regulation, man sinned, and God left. It's a common, it's a common uh, understanding between our African roots and the Bible. But the only difference between our understanding and even the Middle Eastern um, understanding of what happened is that of every tradition, they all believe that God left for good and is still angry until today. But we believe that he left. He didn't just leave us angry with an internal punishment. In Genesis 3, when God, after Adam rebelled against the law, when he comes down to pass judgment and enforce his law, uh, he, after he's told them, don't eat of any of this. Don't eat. You can eat every tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Bible says, on that day when they heard the Lord walking in the garden, Adam hid himself. Why was Adam hiding? He was hiding because God told him that the day you eat, you shall surely die. There was a death penalty. He was supposed to die that day. His expectation is that God is going to kill me. And in their mind, as God is walking around, they believe God has a sword and he's looking for them to destroy them. But they had no idea that God is a just and merciful God. So when he's passing judgment against the serpent, before he passes judgment against Eve and Adam, he says this to the serpent in 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first messianic promise in the Bible. As God is judging Satan in the judgment, he gives a promise of mercy and redemption for the human beings before he even comes to deal with them. And this is a unique thing about the biblical view of God in that in his judgment, there was the penalty of sin as well as the mercy for man. While punishing their sin, he creates an opportunity for redemption through Jesus Christ. In other words, in Eden on this day, when he was meant to kill Adam and Eve for rebelling, he doesn't kill them. Instead, he gives a prophetic messianic promise that he is actually going to come and die. Oh God, they were supposed to die. But he says, no, I'm going to come and die in your place. You deserve to die, but I'm going to die. 
There is no religion with that view. There is no tradition, African, Middle Eastern, with a view that when God went, he came back to promise that I'm going to die on your behalf. And through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, Hughes identified a pattern about God in five stories. In the story of the fall, in the story of Cain, in the story of the sons of God, and in the story of the flood. He noticed this pattern that Number one, when sin is committed, God makes a speech. Number two, announcing a penalty. And then every time he announces the penalty consistently, God provides grace to ease the misery. Even though he's punishing their sin, he creates a way. How can these people say God is not good when even though we do wrong, he promises a way of redemption. And that's why we always have to be patient and forgiving with one another. We always have to forgive. I was watching this couple talking and this lady was like, my husband confuses me. Whenever I get mad at him, he is quick to forgive. Quick to forgive. We can have an argument and then he'll come and say, honey, do you want some coffee? And it's hard for me to remain mad at him because he is quick to forgive. In this season, may you be quick to forgive. Married couples, don't let arguments go on for days. We've been fighting since uh, apartheid. He died, but I'm still angry. I'm now on social media showing everyone his messages. Because though he's dead, I am still must be quick to forgive and move on. Because that's how our God is. In the case of Adam, they were, Adam and Eve, they were banished from Eden. But the death penalty was withheld. And the promise of a Messiah was given. And God even kills an animal and says, Take off those fig leaves which are hiding your sin. I've got an even better covering. Come here. Wear this. Are you hearing me here? When man fell in sin, Satan said, here, eat. But Jesus comes in the New Testament. And the second time we see we hear, here, eat, is at the Last Supper. Eat my body. Eat my redemption. You fell through this sin, but I'm now redeeming you. He, he is a God who is constantly finding ways to restore us and to forgive us. And you have to believe that as you are, he is always finding ways to forgive us. He could have killed Adam and Eve, but he is slow to anger. He could have even killed Cain. Do you know that when Cain killed Abel, when God came to judge him, he didn't kill Cain. And Cain even said, your punishment is too hard. They're going to kill me. Everyone is mad at me. They're going to kill him. Do you know what God did for Cain? He gave Cain a mark. And he made this promise to Cain. If anyone kills Cain, I will take vengeance against that person sevenfold. Cain who killed Abel. God promised that if you kill the killer, I'm going to kill you and seven other people in your family. The grace of God will mess up your life. The mercy of God will mess up your life. And sometimes we are not thankful enough for his mercy. And part of the problem with us as Christians who've been saved for a long time is sometimes we feel like, ah, I didn't sin that much. I wasn't like my friends. I actually deserve salvation. I know my cousins, they were drunkards, they were doing all this stuff. Me, I, I never did anything. I was always good, and I gave my life to the Lord at a youth group. And Jesus warns us in a parable in Luke chapter 7, when this woman comes to anoint his feet, and the Pharisees are like, if he's a real prophet, he must know that this woman is a sinner. She doesn't deserve to be anointing his feet. And Jesus tells them a parable of a man who owed, one man was owed 500 pieces of silver and another man 50 pieces of silver. And when they couldn't pay him back, he forgave both of them. And he asked, who will appreciate this forgiveness? The one who owes 50 or the one who owes 500? 
And Peter said, ah, that's obvious. The one who owes more will love this man more than the one who owes least. And your problem is you don't appreciate God's forgiveness because you believe you owed him very little. And you deserve his forgiveness. And that's because you don't know that as you were born through Adam, you were guilty and headed to hell by virtue of the fallen Adam. All have sinned and fallen short of his glory. And we have all received mercy. No matter how many bad things we did, we were all guilty and headed to hell. And we don't appreciate the mercy and forgiveness of God. The small sins I've committed, God still cares about them. And, we, and this is because we don't even understand what sin is. Sin is not just sinful acts of rebellion against God. But this is what scares me about sin. Sin is actually the condition of our hearts. All of us. We all have sinful hearts from Adam. Piper said, underneath all the misuses of money, sex, and power is the sinful heart condition. Sin is any feeling or thought or action that comes from a heart that doesn't treasure God above all things. Erickson said, sin is an inward inclination. It is not merely wrong acts of sinfulness, but it is actually sinfulness itself. It is the inherent inner disposition in all mankind to rebel against God. So based on this, sin is more than just acts of sin. It's a self destructive condition in all of our hearts and it's this condition that produces sinful acts that lead to our destruction frame said that sin is irrational why would anyone turn away from the beauty and joy of obeying god in a covenant life and embrace the opposite which is death and destruction Frame goes on further to say, why do people think they can succeed in rebelling against God who is omnipotent, unquote? Sin is irrational. It's an irrational inclination in all of us against God, against his design, where we think we can be our own gods. It's, it's a destructive force which we all have, every one of us. Every one of us have the capacity to make a huge mistake that can get you on the daily sun. Every one of us have the capacity to do something in one minute that can destroy 30 years of ministry. That's why when you see these pastors fall, don't celebrate. Pray and say, after building this kind of ministry, what was he thinking? When you get there, you're going to face some of the things he faced. And you can think from here, ah, I've got it under control. But you can get there and that sinful inclination will do something irrational. Think of people, think of even the, the Palapala ah, 600,000. It doesn't make sense. It's something irrational. You look at South Africa, you look at all the things that are happening. It, it doesn't make sense. How can someone say, in 2022, this pool is for white people in a place called Free State? This pool is only for white people. Sin is irrational and it's self destructive. Now they're going to jail, they're facing murder charges. They could have just eaten their Christmas and left everyone alone. But sin is irrational and self-destructive. Sin produces destruction wherever it goes. And Genesis, if there's anything it's telling us, is that Christian, you need God. You can never overcome sin. Sin is not the act. It's a force that is still in your heart right now. Every one of us have sin in our hearts. It's sin that causes us. Sometimes I can, I can have an argument with my wife and then I'm alone. I'm like, that was 
about nothing. Irrational. <laughs> Irrational. That's how sin is. Sin is self-destructive. It will destroy you. And that's why you need God. And that's why you need Jesus. And it's only through Jesus Christ that we have the power to overcome sin. It's only through Jesus Christ that we have the power to walk in freedom. And it's only when we are glorified in heaven where that sin nature within us will be gone forever. Let's stand. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I've been thinking about heaven a lot, and there's one thing I'm worried about in heaven. Jesus said there's no marriage in heaven. And I'm like, so I'm going to build this connection with my wife, and then in heaven is, what's up? <laughs> Who are you? Oh, nice to meet you. Okay. It's over. Hi. I'm praying about that one. <laughs> So my wife will be there. And we're not chilling. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I want to enjoy heaven with my wife. Amen. <laughs> I want to be in heaven with my wife and just enjoying and talking. Hey, there's Adam, you see. There's Eve. And I'm like, hey, there's uh, Bathsheba. There's uh, David. This is awkward. <laughs> you know? So, but there's no marriage in heaven. Hey, yeah, hey, hey. Santa Maria, Lord have mercy. But we're only going to get over the sin nature when we're in heaven. But while we're on earth, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the Word of God. And He gives us the power to overcome sin. In this season, I want you to spend time in Genesis. Look at it from a God perspective. Not from a little God perspective. Look at it from how big God is, number one. Number two, study how sin in Genesis just destroyed everything it touched. Destroyed Cain and Abel. Destroyed all these people's lives. Destroyed by the power of sin. And then look at South Africa today and you'll see that everything happening around us, it is sin in the hearts of men that is messing up South Africa. So the only way South Africa can be saved is through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need revival. We need people to turn to God. And it starts off with Christians. Stop sinning at work by not delivering well at work. You are in sin when you're not doing a good job. Excellence and integrity on that job. It's so important. That's where it starts. As husbands, love your wives or you're in sin. Unconditionally. Or else you're in sin. Are you hearing me here? Let's, let's be great, great Christians. Let's, this year, let's be true Christians. Let's not be these halfway Christians with no prayer life, no Bible life. You don't pray, you don't read the Bible, you don't worship, you're not kind, you're not loving, you're not excellent. Let's be real, strong Christians this year who love God, walk with God, and love and obey the Word of God. Are you hearing me here? God loves you. There's no religion where their God came to die for them. When they sinned, he, he ran to the sky and left them forever. He came and died for us. Then he rose again. And we're going to meet him one day. But while we're here, we're going to use our gifts and our talents to serve our families, serve our communities, and be as great as God wants us to be. I hear him here. So married people, enjoy your marriage while you're on earth. Don't hear that there's no marriage in heaven and say, that's why it's heaven and not hell. I don't want to continue these problems. I'm glad we don't have to talk anymore there. Thank you, Jesus. You're wiser. Because on the first day in heaven, we'll have a fight. <laughs> Are you hearing me here? <laughs> but in heaven, love one another on earth. Because in heaven, you're not going to be together. Father God, help us today. 
in this world that is messed up in south africa help us to be the lights help us to be the examples help us father to move in integrity to move in holiness help us father to be great parents great husbands great wives help us father to be great employees great business people help us to be great students help us father to take care of our bodies help us father to exercise to eat well help us father in this season father not to sin against our minds father by just consuming junk and not studying or reading books or developing creative